Good afternoon. J. Wayne Flint grew up in Alabama and attended Samford University as a history and theology student. Where he went, then he went on to Florida State University, where he took his PhD in 1965. He came back to Sanford and taught for about a dozen years. And then he came to Auburn in 1977 as chair of the history department. Uh, he stayed at Auburn, thank very good thing for all of us, uh, until last year when he retired as distinguished university professor. He does still kind of hang around campus and do something every now and then. But few people in any line of endeavor uh, accomplish as much or win as much acclaim as Wayne Flint has in his career. Uh, he has published 11 books, won numerous awards for those, a pillar of the historical profession, a great mentor to graduate students, president of the Southern Historical Association, um, more than 5,000 members. I think what distinguishes Wayne most, though, in my opinion, there are other eminent historians. There are other people who publish lots of books. Uh, very few historians evidence Wayne's commitment to his community, to his state, and his region throughout their career. It is his, I think, contributions to outreach that really separate him from all but just a very few historians that I can even remotely think of. And so that's what I'm going to focus on today uh, in my introduction. The topic of Wayne's talk is Auburn University serving the community. I don't think there has been a greater champion of outreach at Auburn uh, than Wayne. As Dr. Cook was mentioning, he's served on committees defining the outreach missions of the university and has contributed a lot to them himself. Um, when he was at Sanford in the 1960s, not exactly a placid time in our history, uh, he organized voter registration drives among black voters in Homewood. Um, he did numerous outreach uh, efforts in the Birmingham community to try to promote social justice. He has continued with that. He's been an advocate for children and the poor, who in our society are too often the same group uh, throughout his career. He's worked with organizations as diverse as the National Cancer Society, Alabama Citizens for Constitutional Reform. He was the facilitator for the school equity funding lawsuit in the state of Alabama, and he has been for more than 30 years involved in projects he started and has helped carry on in Perry County to combat poverty there. He's on the board of the Mary Reynolds Babcock Foundation, which is the country's leading philanthropy devoted to trying to eradicate poverty in the South. He has been a stalwart of programs at the Center for the Arts and Humanities here at Auburn at Pebble Hill. Uh, he is now the editor-in-chief of the Online Encyclopedia of Alabama, which is a joint project of Auburn University, the Alabama Humanities Foundation, and more than two dozen other agencies. It's based here at Auburn, has offices here in the library uh, under Dr. Jeff Jakeman. These things that I've talked about are just a handful, really, uh, of the investments that Wayne has made in the community over the years. Uh, he has traveled hundreds of thousands of miles, uh, especially in crisscrossing Alabama, uh, to deal with social problems, apply his expertise as a historian to making the state better. And he has also educated an awful lot of people about the history of their state and the region. He is a model to me of the sort of engaged intellectual, the kind of hands-on academic that represents the best of the land-grant university tradition. So I'm proud today to introduce Dr. Wayne Flynn. Thank you, Dr. Cook and Tony Carey as well. I wish my wife had been here for that. Uh, uh, she had just been mesmerized and absolutely stunned and surprised by all that. Uh, her task is to keep me humble after introductions like that, and she does a brilliant job of it, and has for half a century now. Uh, some, uh, sometimes uh, through my career, people have asked me, uh, how do you like Auburn, knowing that I had come from a private university, and knowing that uh, during the years here, I'd had numerous opportunities to go elsewhere. And uh, I always said, well, you know, no place is perfect, but this one is a darn good place. And right at the heart of that darn good place is outreach. Uh, 
Uh, and so nothing could be closer to my heart or more important to my identity and my pride in Auburn than the session we're going to have today. As always, with any kind of historical lecture I do, I always start with context. That is, um, if, if we want to talk about outreach at Auburn, what is the larger story in which this ought to be placed? And I'd like to suggest uh, five contextual arguments that I want to make. Uh, then I want to briefly talk about the history of the university, very briefly, and a couple of people who are central to outreach in a very broad sense. And then what I want to do is tell you two parallel stories. One story is basically the interior world of the Agricultural Extension Service at Auburn, and one is the interior world of the History Department at Auburn. So contextual part first. Uh, between 1800 and 1900, higher education in America was very much rooted in the uh, extension of European classical education. It was the quiv uh, quadrivium and the trivium, uh, the classical divisions of universities and colleges. The only people who really needed to go to college were people who were going to teach or people who were going to preach or people who were going to practice law or a handful of other professions. And most of the really excellent colleges were in that mode and private. Uh, you think about higher education at highest level in the South during the 19th century, and you think about Tulane, Duke, Vanderbilt, Davidson, Millsaps, Old Southwestern College, and now Rhodes College in Memphis, Wake Forest, the University of Richmond, SMU, TCU, Hendricks College in Arkansas, Birmingham Southern, Emory, and incidentally, uh, I might add that of those schools I mentioned, more than half were Methodist which is a part of the story I want to tell you. The second part of the context is what happened in the mid-19th century and the rise of the elective system in higher education. A Baptist, a plug for my denomination, a Baptist, Fr Francis Whalen, who was, who was president of Brown University in Rhode Island, developed uh, a very utilitarian concept of education. He felt that too much of education had been devoted to Latin and Greek and a very small proportion of Americans and therefore argued for a more utilitarian curriculum that would feature the sciences, that would educate agriculturalists, as he called them, manufacturers, mechanics, merchants. And keep in mind, Baptists were, by, by and large, lower middle class and even poor people in that age. And so, in many ways, Francis Whalen's idea, philosophy of education, was to go to the people his people, the Baptist people of New England, and then by extension his ideas spread south and west. That was also the period in American higher education when professionalization began to develop and the agitation by Whalen basically morphed into the career of U.S. Senator Justin S. Morrill of Vermont, who of course was a close friend of Francis Whalen and a part of the same kind of reform movement. Morrill pr proposed basically to take Francis Whalen's ideas and install them in the land-grant university, and that bill passed Congress, and you sort of know the rest of that story from earlier sessions. A third, what happened in the early 20th century. Already the land-grant universities were beginning to take education to the people in ways that I will get to in a minute, but keep in mind that uh, the extension program had not yet begun. The Hatch Act was passed in 1887, but the Smith-Lever Act was not passed until 1914. And so extension is a glimmer in the eye of reformers, but nothing more than that. And so, in a sense, Smith-Lever Act needs to be understood in a much larger context as well. In the state universities, in the so-called progressive era between 1900 and 1920, Many educators began to think of education as something that ought to be democratized in the classic American sense, that private schools and state universities had equally been the province of the American elite, the American upper class, and that if education was going to sustain American democracy, higher education needed to be taken to the people, and it needed to be an instrument of fundamental change within society. Now, let me just tell you one story within a whole range of possible stories. I could tell you the story of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, I could tell you the story of the University of Wisconsin, which is probably the university, the state university that did more in this area than any other university in the United States. But let me take the University of South Carolina. Uh, the University of South Carolina had a president in the early part of the 20th century by the name of Samuel Charles Mitchell. Mitchell was, like Francis Whalen, Baptist. 
like Whalen also, he had a deep uh, ethos of reform in his background, but he had also been trained in the classical trivium and quadrivium of the 19th century. He had attended Georgetown College, a very fine Baptist college in Kentucky. He had attended the University of Chicago, a very fine Baptist university that was gra gradually shifting toward a more secular orientation in Illinois, parenthetically, uh, Brown University, one of the finest Ivy League universities in America, was originally Baptist. Uh, the University of Chicago, which has 38 Nobel Prize winners, second in the world only to Cambridge University, was a Baptist university. So those of you who are uh, accustomed to dismissing my people as just a bunch of hayseeds and ridge runners had better get up with a story here. And then he had gone back to teach after his PhD at the University of Chicago at the University of Richmond, also a Baptist college. Welding a deep ethos of biblical reform on very fine academic degrees in history, Mitchell became one of the preeminent Virginia reformers of his time. During the last years of the 19th century and the first years of the 20th, for instance, he joined the rural school movement, the public health movement, the movement to abolish lynching in the South, the good roads movement. He was a Darwinian evolutionist, and he believed in economic development of the South in that sense, a sort of New South proponent. Early into the 20th century, Mitchell left Richmond, the University of Richmond, to go to the University of South Carolina. And out of South Carolina, he, to quote one biographer, tried to revitalize reason and take reason to the people, advocating universal education, outreach, service to the state of South Carolina. And incidentally, you might keep in mind that late in the 19th century, Clemson University had been founded as a land-grant university to take education to the farmers. And so in a sense, Mitchell understood this as a turf battle between two competing concepts of education. Uh, a more populistic, radical kind of Clemson education going to the farmers of the Piedmont in South Carolina and the University of South Carolina trying to catch up with an ethos of reform that was more strongly in the less demagogic mainline tradition of reform. The fourth period is one that most of you will re recognize as the Smith-Lever Act of 1914. Hoke Smith was a former governor and then United States uh, representative from the state of Georgia. Uh, Lever was a congressman from South Carolina, and together they put together the Smith-Lever Act to provide federal land grants to land-grant universities for the purpose of extending the knowledge of experiment stations on campus to the people, to take education to the ordinary people, to every county and farm community in the United States. Uh, one agricultural historian has called this, and here I'm quoting, one of the most successful ventures of federal, state, local, and pr private collaboration in the history of the United States, and so it was. So now you've got the classical land-grant universities, you've got the state universities that are drifting in a more progressive direction, such as the University of Wisconsin, the University of North Carolina, the University of South Carolina. They're becoming involved with things like uh, public schools, public health, and other kind of reform programs. And now you've got an organized, institutionalized effort to take knowledge from agricultural research on campuses out to the people. The final stage is a, a stage that I was involved in in the late 20th century. Uh, thanks to Dr. Muse, President Muse, and Vice President Wilson, Auburn, uh, though not a cutting edge kind of pioneer in the modern outreach movement, was darn close to it. Uh, there were a few schools, the University of Florida, Michigan State University, the University of Washington, and a handful of others that were perhaps a bit more advanced. But Auburn was very close to the trendsetters, the leaders in the area of academic and university outreach. The idea here was fairly simple. Uh, universities were losing contact with taxpayers in a time in which there were a lot of competitors for tax revenue that was basically declining because of all sorts of demands on the federal budget. Public education, public health, the tremendous cost of Social Security, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and other programs. And with all these competing centers of gravity within American politics, the idea was, unless we do something to connect universities back to the constituencies they serve, 
then uh, universities may very well be considered by the very large majority of people in most states who never go to college as being largely irrelevant to their lives. So the idea of expansion or outreach in the late 20th century was to meld faculties by rationalizing outreach within the academy and to establish guidelines for tenure and promotion based upon contributions to outreach. Outreach would then become a legitimate function of university life with the same measurable standards and guidelines comparable to teaching and research. And you would have a trica of promotion and tenure standards that would be teaching, research, and outreach. Now, I want to distinguish between the classic concept of service that everyone is expected to do in a university to the definition that I'm using here of outreach. For instance, if I speak to the Rotary Club in Auburn about a subject, that is not outreach. Uh, but on the other hand, if I develop a series of lectures based upon my academic research and interest in poverty, or say Alabama history slash constitutional reform, and I speak at a series of Rotary Clubs from one end of Alabama to the other, and the hypothesis from which I develop this series of lectures is to change public policy toward rewriting the Alabama Constitution or reducing poverty, and then I publish the result of my work, maybe not in a traditional journal or book, but at least in an op-ed column or a newspaper or somewhere else. That is outreach. So outreach assumes that you're working from your academic discipline. It assumes that you have a systematic approach to the way in which you apply that academic, academic discipline in a non-traditional classroom. And it assumes that there is some sort of measurement, i.e., the number of times you're mentioned in news releases, that cover your st story and spread your story from the Rotary Club to the larger community are people who contact you by email or write you letters so that these become measurable ways in which you say you're influencing the state, you're influencing public policy, your series of lectures, your series of programs are doing something to change society in a way that you have consciously uh, philosophized about and determined ought to be done. Now, if you understand this, uh, I think you understand my definition of outreach and the way I'm going to treat it in this session today. That is, what we're doing here is institutionalizing outreach, which had always been a mandate of agriculture ever since the Hatch Act and the Smith-Lever Act, but now we're trying to establish this as a broad thrust of the entire university, and we're trying to normalize this in areas like the rural studio and architecture, the Auburn Humanities Center in liberal arts, the College of Education's numerous programs of outreach around the state with schools, urban and rural, uh, the Encyclopedia of Alabama, all of these are the legitimate conceptual designs of people who are well educated in their fields and trying to take their education beyond the classrooms at Auburn or even beyond the uh, extended education of technology. Outreach is different from faculty service and I think it's very important to understand that and it is measurable and it's very important to understand that. And if we really think about education holistically, yes, it, it's great to have people who do research and write books. Yes, it is excellent to have uh, patents taken out by our scientists and our engineers. Uh, yes, it is excellent to have brilliant teachers in the classroom. Yes, it is also very important to con be concerned about the quality of life of four and a half million Alabamians who pay your salaries and who provide for this university. Now, uh, having said all that, those are the five sort of components of this to connect a state university, a land-grant university in particular, to its people and to its problems and to its culture. I'd like to go to a second uh, phase of this presentation, which is to tell you a little bit about the history of this particular university in that regard. Uh, here I'm going to rely on a number of wonderful books that my students have done, mainly uh, I'm so very proud of them, and certainly uh, having them work mainly in Alabama history, uh, they've made tremendous contributions to this story. For instance, Michael Williams, who received his master's degree at Auburn after an undergraduate at Troy State and has just published a book in 2005 called Isaac Taylor Titchener, The Creation of the Baptist New South. Incidentally, he was a Baptist, um, <laughs> former pastor of Montgomery First Baptist Church, a chaplain in the Confederate Army who became so outraged at... Uh, Union soldiers at the Battle of Shiloh that he put his Bible down, took out a uh, rifle uh, from a dead Confederate sharpshooter and proudly killed three Union officers. Uh, that was one of the great 
moments in his life about which he bragged while he was president here in Auburn. Uh, he was also the interim pastor of my church, and I've always thought that uh, given our decidedly pacifist direction these days, it would be interesting to see how he'd fare in our, in our church these days. He was described by a contemporary here at Auburn as, quote, a broad-minded man for his times, deeply interested in cultural and literary matters, a man who wrote poetry for his friends and had one of the finest libraries in East Alabama. Also a self-taught metallurgical engineer, uh, one of the pioneers of Bibb County coal fields, and one of the architects of the New South Industrial Movement before he went to the home mission board of the Southern Baptist Convention and literally single-handedly almost created a sectional Baptist identity of Southern Baptist as opposed to National Baptist uh, out of the intense sectionalism that had caused him to pick up that uh, rifle at Shiloh and kill all those Yankees. As president of this university in its first 10 years as a land-grant university, his job was to mesh a Methodist college, you remember the history of the 19th century, a classically trivium, quadrivium, Latin, Greek, historical university college onto the modern land-grant concept. No one could have been better at it than I.T. Titchener a man with a classical Baptist education and as a minister, and also a self-taught metallurgical engineer who had mastered a very difficult uh, geological and metallurgical background, uh, largely self-taught and still to this day greatly highly regarded by metallurg metallurgical and technological historians for his work in the Bibb County coal fields. The state legislature refused to give the college any money for the land grant program, and so during his time here, he largely presided over of the classical remnant of a Methodist liberal arts college and a new mandate to create a, a land-grant university but without the resources to do it. So it's a sort of nascent land-grant college, a land-grant college in the making. Here are some of his observations and I'm going to cite them because they become so larger, so important in the larger story I want to tell. Um, writing of, quote, men of letters such as usually compose college faculties they rarely have any knowledge of or taste for agricultural pursuits. The classic division of Ag Hill and liberal arts. There is danger in every such institution that the agricultural department will either be strangled or starved by those who are expected to be its nurses or guardians. Hence, for instance, the terror of Ag Hill when Harry Philpott a Yale theologian was picked from the University of Florida to become president, and E.T. York, the other major candidate for that job from the College of Agriculture, incidentally a wonderful man with a tremendous career later at the University of Florida, was uh, turned down for that job. On the other hand, Titchener wrote, agriculturalists often exhibit a strong prejudice against what they call book farming and academics. The reason for this suspicion? Here again, Titchener, many a farmer who has sent his son to college has been pained to find that the youthful graduate had no longer any sympathy with farm life, that all the thoughts of industrial pursuits were irksome to him and nothing but a profession would meet the requirements of his new ambition. Uh, men are like hogs. They are raised in the country and consumed at the university. So uh, we take all these farm kids, 95% of our people were farmers, and we bring them to the college, and what we do is pound out of them the ambition to be farmers, and we send them out to the professional world. Now, to me, Titchener in the 1870s has the classic dilemma of outreach. And that dilemma has perplexed advocates of university outreach, including me, when I was chair of the outreach committee here at Auburn, ever since. Faculties who consider outreach and service largely irrelevant to their academic values, ambitions, and goals. And citizens who consider university faculties largely irrelevant to their lives and problems. Uh, you can call it an ivory tower versus the real world if you want, but I think it is still to this day the essential dilemma of higher education. The new innovations of the times, of course, uh, are going to affect Titchener's world in Auburn. The rise of the elective system, where students are no longer taking Latin and Greek, they're taking horticulture and, and metallurgical engineering. Uh, the development of uh, 
what I call the professionalization of the academy, that is uh, scholars who are no longer so much drawn from the people as they are drawn from the German model of seminars and higher education and graduate education and publications, uh, places like Johns Hopkins University, which introduced the German seminar to the United States. And finally, formal agricultural and mechanical arts or education. Now in terms of this, uh, this story, after Titchener left to become head of the Home Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention and basically sectionalized Baptist life in America, uh, we had two presidents here at Auburn, one William Braun, the other David Boyd, and it is during those years, 1882, 1884, that Auburn really became a true land-grant university. And something that has been lost upon most people who talk about Auburn but was not lost uh, to uh, Gene Stevenson and Joe Yeager uh, in their chapter 25 of their book uh, on Ag Hill is that the politics of Auburn required that those folks who were connected to agriculture, which represented such a large percentage of people in the Alabama legislature, would have to go out and help Auburn raise the money to become a land-grant university. And for those of you who have not read, uh, I'm glad to see Gene and Joe here, but if you've not read their book on Ag Hill, you really ought to get it because their chapter 25 on uh, politics is just an absolutely brilliant look at this university and agricultural extension. And it was from the College of Agriculture and from people in that area of the university who were going down to the state legislature and lobbying people like themselves, planters from the Black Belt, uh, large farmers and the new industrialists from Birmingham, and were actually raising money to create the first real land-grant university, which was not created in 1872, but was created between 1882 and 1884. And at that time, you began to get agricultural courses that created a curriculum for agriculture, and at the same time, you began to get a curriculum that reflected the new humanities, Latin, modern foreign languages, history. John Dunklin, professor of Latin and history, who offered the first course in ancient and modern history in 1884. And of course, the Hatch Act, 1887, uh, three years later, creating the Agricultural Experiment Station on the land-grant college. Then, of course, there was George Petrie, who is central to the story as well. I recommend Barbara, uh, Brenda Madsen's wonderful thesis here in the uh, Special Collections, a uh, marvelous study of Petrie, and I wish Brenda had finished that as a doctoral dissertation. It's certainly a subject worthy of the st study. Let me tell you a little bit about Petrie's role in outreach. With his new MA from the University of Virginia, he was appointed adjunct professor of modern languages and history, the two departments were at that time combined, at an annual salary of $750 in 1887. Think about that for a while. Uh, and for those of you who complain about your load, I'm speaking here as a chairman who, who heard this uh, quite frequently in my career. George Petrie started his first year teaching 37 recitations a week in French, German, Latin, history, and English for $7,500 a year, or $750 a year. In 1889, Petrie, of course, left Auburn for Johns Hopkins to get his Ph.D. in languages uh, so that he could come back and teach languages, Latin, Greek, French, German here at Auburn, but he was bored with the foreign language program, which apparently was not taught very well at Johns Hopkins and fascinated by Dr. Herbert Baxter Adams, who had just brought the German seminar system to Johns Hopkins and who laid out before his students not a series of tried and true, uh, well-published and well-thought-about uh, ideas of history, but who gave his students primary sources and said, now you make sense out of these. So he drove his students not to listen to lectures, but to look at primary documents and come up with their own thesis about history. Among the visiting lecturers for the seminar at Johns Hopkins when Petrie was there was a young professor from Princeton by the name of Woodrow Wilson, among many others, who influenced him. And so with the influence of all these people and Herbert Baxter Adams taking him to lectures across uh, Baltimore, uh, a center of intellectual discourse at that time with Goucher College and Johns Hopkins and lots of other centers of, of thought. H.L. Um, uh, Mencken, uh, you know, was a Baltimorean at the time. And this is what uh, Petrie wrote about these years of his life, late 19th century, 1890s. I had never before known the real thing. History had seemed a mass of facts and dates to be memorized. Now for the first time I found it to be human life writ large. I love that phrase. History is human life writ large. A thing to be understood and enjoyed. A field full of an infinite variety of researchables. I felt like a boy in a storeroom 
full of preserves and jellies to be consumed. He wrote his dissertation on a very contemporarily important subject, church and state in early Maryland. Uh, came back to Auburn, and when he came back, uh, President Braun recommended a professorship of history and Latin for his new professor, the first time in the history of Auburn that a non-scientific area had received a professorship. There were seven professorships at the time. Uh, Petrie's was the first outside the area of science and agriculture. Petrie created a, a history curriculum and in 1893 requested $100 uh, in the university records here for a stereopticon and slides because he wanted to use them in, quote, my missionary lecturing around the state to build support for Auburn. Very interesting idea. Uh, that's uh, 1893. Uh, that is, of course, in addition to the fact that that year he also introduced football to the South when a colleague from, jo from Johns Hopkins, who also was in history at the University of Georgia, decided that they would bring this manly uh, Northern game to the South in order to prop up Southern manhood. Uh, <laughs> He had uh, incidentally coached the first team, he played on the first team, he purchased the equipment, he laid out the playing field just uh, this direction from Sanford Hall. He recruited and coached the players, uh, he scheduled the games, he took all the trips, he handled all the public relations for the football team, so he was David Housel and the athletic director and the football coach, and, uh, and Kenny Irons all rolled into one. In 1913, there's another very interesting battle in which Petrie was engaged, and this was the battle uh, that uh, Anthony Donaldson talked a little bit about earlier, but it's the battle to basically strip all the liberal arts from Auburn and transfer them to the University of Alabama, and to strip all the scientific and agricultural disciplines and bring them to Auburn. In that deal, Petrie was the key figure. Uh, the University of Alabama under President Denny, who would in, in fact uh, take the University of Alabama in such a different direction f from Auburn, uh, the president of Auburn during the 1920s wanted to de-emphasize football, which he felt it corrupted the university. And uh, President Denny was completely willing to have a little corruption on behalf of a much larger goal in life. So while Denny is taking the University of Alabama to a national championship in 1926 and creating the modern fad of football in the South, uh, the president of Auburn was essentially firing the coach, running him off, driving him to LSU where he became a quite famous and successful coach and getting himself fired in the process. Uh, this is probably counterproductive. That is the de-emphasis of football at Auburn. Well, Petrie was right at the center of all this controversy because uh, President Denny said, we would like to have you come to the University of Alabama and head the history department. So he was offered the history department chairmanship at the University of Alabama. And the reason I think he turned it down was largely because he had created this incredible outreach ethos at Auburn and he had developed the first one of the first graduate programs in the South and his students were doing brilliantly. At places like Johns Hopkins, Columbia University, the University of Chicago, he was, uh, his students were coming out uh, as PhDs, they were going on to distinguished careers, and he simply could not say goodbye to Auburn. So President Thatch here at Auburn and President Denny at the University of Alabama had a meeting. They decided to abolish the liberal arts program at Auburn and Petrie declined to go. He would not participate. And the whole deal fell through. Now how much it fell through because of Petrie, I'm not exactly sure. Probably there were some other factors too. But I know that Petrie's refusal to leave for the University of Alabama was at least one important factor in that decision to drop the plan. Petrie began to lecture more and more around the state. He began to teach more and more current events courses, one of which was incidentally at Langdon Hall and was usually so packed that uh, townspeople would come in as well as students and uh, occasionally a student would have to sit up on the windowsill and one actually went to sleep and fell out the window on one occasion, creating some consternation here. Uh, I don't know what they would do about uh, liability nowadays. Uh, when WAPI Radio became the first radio station in the state, I uh, guess who one of the first uh, participants was? George Petrie, teaching his current events course on WAPI, telling the people of Alabama about the conflicts in the Balkans that would uh, ultimately lead to World War I, or about the League of Nations and the attempts at internationalism, which followed literally tens of thousands of Alabamians who had no formal education received their formal education from George Petrie over station WAPI not to mention all the people here in Auburn who went to Langdon Hall to hear his lectures. His seminars from Johns Hopkins, like Johns Hopkins, 
In addition to turning out wonderful master's candidates who got their PhDs at some of the finest universities in America, also produced history units for the State Department of Education, which were then fanned out to uh, or distributed to high schools all over the state of Alabama. Petrie himself delivered countless lectures. Tony, you think I lectured a lot. He was literally on the road all the time, lecturing to the Alabama Education Association on numerous occasions, trying to educate teachers, speaking to what uh, one historian called virtually every club between Birmingham and Mobile, as well as to Johns Hopkins University, the University of Chicago, and other venues of that sort. Okay, so that's the second part, the story of our little piece of this much larger contextual story. Finally, the politics of outreach. Uh, I mentioned the fact that from the very beginning, politics had played a role as early as 1884 when people in agriculture here at the university tried to get a budget for the school in Montgomery. It's no accident that four years after the, or five years after the creation of Smith Lever, the American Farm Bureau Federation uh, began and began to organize very rapidly in Alabama by 1921. There were nine southern states, including Alabama, that had large chapters of the Farm Bureau Federation. And that was to go with an earlier organization that was much more a small farmer uh, organization called the Farmers Union. So you had the Farmers Union, to which Professor Duggar and, and all the great agriculturalists here at Auburn belonged. They belonged to the Farmers Union. But they also decided to belong to the American Farm Federation. Now, the way I would divide these is largely along class lines. The Farmers Union was a small farmer and to some degree even tenant farmer organization, but mainly small farmer. The Farm Bureau Federation was much more a large agriculture. But even then, there were, there were stiff battles between these two organizations and Auburn's support for them a feeling that Auburn was leaving the background of the Farmers Union and drifting more into the umbrella of Edward A. O'Neill, a farmer from up in Florence, Alabama, who had a plantation and who was from one of the best connected political families in Alabama. In 1931, was elected president of the National Farm Bureau Federation and with consummate skill forged a formidable alliance of southern and midwestern farmers endorsing and powerfully influencing New Deal agricultural policies from that time until the end of the New Deal. In fact, turning agricultural policy toward commercial agriculture and away from small farmers, tenant farmers, and so forth. Meanwhile, New Deal liberal Aubrey Williams from St. Clair County, who grew up uh, the son of an alcoholic uh, uh, iron worker in Birmingham, uh, dropped out of school in the seventh grade uh, before he'd really learned how to work, uh, read and write, uh, began to work for one dollar a week delivering laundry to help feed his siblings and his mother. She, a fierce Cumberland Presbyterian, uh, he then uh, went into the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, was converted, uh, came under the influence of a, a really interesting reform-minded Cumberland Presbyterian pastor, went to Maryville College, became a Presbyterian minister, deeply uh, in favor of social and political and economic reform in Alabama, and became head of the National Youth Administration during the New Deal. Uh, Aubrey Williams was about as far away from Ed O'Neill as two people could possibly be. In fact, he was allied to quite a different Alabama, to the Alabama of Gould Beach, Clifford and Virginia Durr, <laughs> Charles Dobbins, uh, Auburn's registrar, uh, Charlie Edwards, uh, Charlie Edwards who had been one of Petrie's boys, had gone to Harvard University, gotten a master's degree in 1926, and came back to Auburn to become registrar and a legendary figure in the rise of the New Deal and of the Southern Conference for Human Welfare in 1938. Uh, also, Herman Clarence Nixon, a one, another one of Petrie's boys who came from Piedmont, who in the 1930s began to write about poor whites and poor blacks, who wrote a series of books in opposition to another one of the Petrie's boys, Frank L. Owsley, who was a devotee of conservative agrarian politics at Vanderbilt. Herman Clarence, Mitch, uh, Herman Clarence Nixon drifted into the University of North Carolina social reform wing of, of the Democratic Party, wrote books called Lower Piedmont Country uh, uh, and others uh, during that period of time. Uh, he was secretary of the Southern Conference for Human Welfare. Uh, some call it a communist front organization. It certainly had communist in it, but it also had Eleanor Roosevelt and Hugo Black and Lister Hill and lots of other people. Uh, the first meeting of this organization in Birmingham in 1938, Herman Clarence Nixon from Auburn 
was the secretary of the organization. Uh, Charlie Dobbins uh, associated loosely with Auburn for a long time, and we have his library here at the university. Charlie Edwards, the registrar, all associated with the Southern Conference of Human Welfare. Uh, so you have this sort of reform wing of Auburn drifting into New Deal and radical politics and largely from the history department. And then you have the Agricultural Extension Bureau, which is going quite a different direction. In fact, throughout the years of the 1930s, there's this battle between the Farmers Union and the Farm Bureau Federation. By the 1940s, it has reached the proportion of a huge civil war. Aubrey Williams left the New Deal, came back to Alabama, to Montgomery, uh, took over the Southern Farmer, a uh, fairly influential uh, um, farmer's magazine, and began to blast the Cooperative Extension Service at Auburn, uh, saying that its agents in each county had become powerful allies of the Alabama Farm Bureau, uh, which used this alliance to oppose increased property taxes for schools, to oppose the reapportionment of the state legislature, and other reforms. Increasingly and overtly political, the Extension Service Network that worked from Auburn opposed the renomination of U.S. Senator Lister Hill in 1944, sought to block the election of agrarian reformer Jim Folsom in 1946, and was allied to people like Charlie Dobbins, Charlie Edwards, Gould Beach, Aubrey Williams, the Durs, and so forth. And what you have is this nascent civil war between the Farm Bureau on one side, allied to agricultural extension agents in the counties who became the local political czars for the conservative wing of the Democratic Party, while the History Department was turning out people who were on the other side. That's, not, that's a little simplification, but not too much a simplification. Williams made his opposition to the extension program known so well in such a variety of ways that I can document this. Uh, when I was doing research some years ago at the FDR Library at Hyde Park, I discovered the Aubrey William Papers and Bora They Rich. Uh, in one of his letters, he said, in recent years, the Cooperative Extension Program has devoted the major part of its time to servicing the Farm Bureau. Few farmers even see a county agent, must less have a service visit from one of them. In a private letter in 1949, he is even more critical. The land-grant college extension service Farm Bureau triumvirate that runs Alabama has done less and less for the little guy and more and more for commercial agriculture. He used the Southern Farmer to publicize these attitudes in the state. And P.O. Davis, on the other hand, tried to destroy the Farmers Union and Aubrey Williams. These battles merely confirmed what an entire generation of historians have discovered in their own research, myself included, the Cooperative Extension Service at Southern Land Grant Universities in general, and particularly here in Alabama, worked very closely with the Farm Bureau and other conservative interests to defeat the New Deal and other liberal reform movements such as tax reform, constitutional reform, and even efforts to reach and to work with tenant farmers and sharecroppers. P.O. Davis, the director of Extension at Auburn, complained in 1942, for instance, that war industry was siphoning cheap labor off Alabama farms by offering black wages in excess of a dollar a day. A large North Alabama planter declared that the WPA was taking all our hands away from us and putting them to work on the roads. They're going to give them $2 a day and it will break us to pay that much. Many of the extension agents came from substantial farm families and little sympathized with poor people at the bottom of the agricultural ladder anyway. For instance, John Frederick Duggar, who became the first director of the Alabama Experiment Station and the Alabama Extension Service was born on a Hale County plantation and, required three, and acquired 200, 675 acres in Lee County, where he and his sons worked a large number of sharecroppers while he presided over the extension service. When journalist Lorena Hickok was dispatched by Eleanor Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt to come south to investigate relief efforts in the region, she came to Alabama and criticized particularly the extension service. She claimed, quote, that few of them really care about people on relief. Their agents are too silo-minded. They're interested only in better farming. They like working with big, successful farmers. Alabama's female home demonstration agents have a kind of Chautauqua slant on life. They shudder at the idea of walking into a tenant farmer's shack and teaching the wife how to clean the place up. She also accused Alabama extension officials of being far too politically minded. The best example of this being the mistake that the Farm Bureau made opposing uh, Jim Folsom so actively in 1946 and his attempt to depoliticize Auburn by politicizing it. That is, appoint all the Board of Trustees who were friends of Jim Folsom and would therefore take Auburn out of politics. I got a big picture of how that might have happened. Mm -hmm. 
Perhaps it is just as well that the American Farm Bureau ultimately severed its relationship with its Alabama chapter after Ed Lauder took over and directed the uh, Farm Bureau more toward insurance. Then again, you have to remember there were 208 million uh, people in Alabama in 1940 who farmed and only 84,000 who farmed in 1990. In other words, history is not on the side of agricultural extension. The Extension Service at last defanged politically. Uh, again, uh, Yeager and Stevenson talk about this story and especially the role of Ralph Drawn, another one of the Auburn history people who became president and decided to get the, the university out of state politics if he could. And uh, the story of the national climate is certainly a story of that change. As Warren McCord, another very important figure in the history of recent agricultural policy here at Auburn's made clear, the future of the extension program is actually community development. And if you consider the, the litigation that resulted in federal court orders that basically broke up the extension program, sent some of them to Alabama A&M University in the northern part of the state, and shifted others to Tuskegee Institute, it's pretty clear that with the decline of farmers and the rural and community problems in Alabama that are left, a community service and community outreach is the heart of the extension program of the future. It's not going to be serving farmers, of which there are now 85,000 or so on 47,000 farms, which is a little bit less than two people per farm. Um, some times ago, um, I listened to Ruby, uh, a Ruby lecture at Auburn by Gordon Geyer. This was 1994. And he advised extension specialists looking toward the 21st century to honor the past but not to be taken prisoner by it. Uh, the problem of uh, agricultural extension in the future, he said, is to take some risk with outrageous ideas and to expand diversity within both staff and clients and think of community development as holistic and not just agriculture. And here again we see the wonderful work that Warren McCord and others have done at the university here directing agricultural extension in a new direction. So um, in closing, let me say this. To me, Agricultural extension taught us the lesson of how it ought to be done, and to some degree, what ought to be done. You carry education to the people, and you carry education to the people by getting people off this campus and out there. The tragedy of agricultural extension, that it was on behalf of an agenda that was basically rooted in the plantation big mule mentality and politics of the late 19th and 20th centuries. And what that did is basically help lock Alabama into a world of inequity and poverty and racial injustice. But at the same time, I think you ought to keep in mind that there were an awful lot of people who were involved in outreach. I think of Charlie Edwards and uh, a huge number of others, uh, Herman Clarence Nixon and others, who basically during that same period of time are subverting Alabama culture with the very same philosophical idea. That is, what we're to do as scholars is to get off our collective rear ends leave our classrooms, and take our knowledge to the people. It's the only place in America, uh, the only place in the world, where you find the idea that education is a democratic idea that ought to educate the masses rather than an elitist idea that ought to train those who are in the upper echelons of the society. It's something we contributed to America. That Smith-Lever Act is, to me, the most important model of education and how proud I am to be at a university where it's no longer confined just to agriculture and where it's rewarded as a part of the tenure and promotion process. So uh, if, this, if this sounds like a paying of praise to uh, Auburn University, it is. Thank you. The main story is the story of Ag Hill. And you can say, well, yeah, of course, because they were paid to do this, because they had a mandate to do this. Well, I mean, why couldn't people in the liberal arts figure it out? And, you know, as I've said many times, uh, one of the things I tried to do for eight years as department head in the history department was to get us to hire an agricultural historian. Doesn't that seem just like a no-brainer? I mean, and, you know, it's not like there were not thousands of them out there. And I thought, you know, what, what better way of creating a, a relationship than to have an agricultural historian? Uh, I think of Brooks Blevins, the best graduate student I've ever had. Brooks Blevins is a historian of American agriculture. And uh, it... Uh, you know, I, bl I blame some of the problems on Auburn by the, on the politicization of agriculture. No question about it. If you don't believe me, read Stevenson and Yeager. On the other hand, I blame an awful lot of the problems at Auburn that I saw while I was here on the sort of, of elitism of people uh, in Haley Center 
who basically turned their, their you know, nose down and thought, you know, well, they're academics and intellectuals, and then there are people in agriculture. Well, you know, that's ridiculous, absurd. It's absurd for the university. It's counterproductive. It hurts the university. It hurts internally within the university. It splits us up into, into uh, turgid water-type compartments. There's no cross-fertilization. Uh, my experience is there are some brilliant professors in agriculture and some awfully dull ones in liberal arts. But I don't think that's the, I don't, I, I think th 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 these two mutually hostile and destructive stereotypes circulate in both worlds. Yeah, the, the question for those of you in the back uh, was that uh, John Holman and Dr. Wilson and I uh, basically tried to uh, uh, lead an outreach movement to reward by tenure and promotion, and uh, what good things have resulted from that. Let me use your, your, your field, forestry, as a good example of this. Uh, the work that Dean Gerstad's done with, with, um, with woodlots and the, the contribution he's made to, I mean, you know, Dean is such a quiet person that he doesn't get involved like Warren Flick did in, in these larger uh, sort of micro debates in, on, agric on timber policy and taxation and so forth. But uh, one of the things that uh, Dean Gerstad has done is he's, he's written a lot about the wood dealer system. Uh, Warren Flick did. And then Dean has talked about woodlots and the way in which small woodlots drive policy. Uh, Warren Flick's talked a lot about the fact that actually uh, timber in Alabama is not large timber plantations owned by Georgia Pacific. It's mainly small parcels of land that are privately owned by people who either still live on the land and farm or people who've drifted off in the cities or retired from Auburn and own small 40-acre, 100-acre plots. Therefore, when you talk about uh, taxing timber interest to derive income that would revolutionize all of Alabama's tax policy. You're talking about revenue. I think Warren figured 25, 26 million dollars a year. I mean, you know, this is not like it's going to revolutionize Alabama at all. That's assuming you went up to the average price of uh, per acre uh, timber land in Georgia, which is something like four dollars an acre rather than one dollar an acre in Alabama. Uh, Dean Gerstand has talked about uh, woodlots. He's written about woodlots. There are all sorts of technical studies he's done of that. He's talked about uh, the way you use chemical fertilizers to kill competing hardwoods to uh, speed the development of, of uh, timber, of, of pine forest, and uh, get them to a 20-year uh, pulpwood market and that kind of thing. So far as I know, neither Warren Flick nor Dean Gerstad wrote a book. I've been trying to get Dean to write a book for a long time because I think a book on woodlots would be a great service to the state, but so far as I know, they haven't written such a book. Uh, Warren didn't before he left. But the point is, those two guys know as much about woodlot development, chemical fertilizers and competing hardwoods, uh, about uh, how, you, how you get uh, rapid growth in, in pine forest. Uh, they have probably helped more people in Alabama to make more money to live a good life than I ever will with 11 books, 50,000 copies of which have been sold and are read and put upon shelves. Uh, now, you tell me why Dean Gerstad should not be rewarded if Dean never wrote, he did write some articles in professional journals, but if he never wrote a single article, are you telling me that he's less important to this university than I am? Are you telling me that he's less important to the people of Alabama than I am? I just don't believe that. And so for the first time now, there is a regularized, institutionalized way where the Tenure Promotion Committee will look at someone like Dean Gerstad and they will not see a group of monographs and they will not see 50 teaching awards, but what they will see is a huge record of service to the state and its people. And the idea that somehow we can't measure that or that that's not academic enough, I just don't believe that. A follow-up question, Wayne. Have you seen, as a result of your work and the problem, 
decrease in the amount of outreach as you define it amongst the liberal arts department? Uh, the question is, do I see an increase in, in liberal arts um, uh, outreach uh, as well as in agriculture? And, you know, I, I'd like to say yes, and I'm not sure I have. Uh, our committee came up with the idea, and Wilson uh, instructed the academic departments to do this. He said, you know, if you don't already have an outreach person in your department, then your next search ought to be for one, somebody who is going to move outside the university, someone who can articulate a plan for taking the history department, the English department, outside the university. Actually, it hasn't worked very well. And I think I know the reason it hasn't worked very well. Uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of hungry people getting PhDs who'd like to have jobs. And if you want them to be outreach, they're outreach, right up to the time they get tenure, at which time they go to the archives and start doing research on their monographs. And so, you know, uh, the, the people who have been the outreach folks at Auburn are the people who had it in their gut before they came here or loved it and believed in it. Jay, I'm thinking of Jerry Brown. I'm thinking of Bert Hitchcock. Uh, I'm thinking of, of um, uh, John Kirkendall. Uh, now, there, there are three areas, you know, religion, journalism, and English, but it was in their guts. They believed in it, and they believed in it for exactly the same reason I do, because I think academics have a responsibility to state university to serve the people of their state and to address the problems of their state. And I think the idea of the Humanity Center to go to small communities, uh, not the big cities, but small communities, and put on programming that celebrate the culture and the religion and the sense of community of the people in places like East Toboga and Wetumpka and Wedowie and Demopolis and Lord knows I know every back road in Alabama now, thanks to Jay. And I can't tell you what a celebration of education that's been for me. I can't tell you how much more I'd rather be out there on a Friday or Saturday afternoon in front of 500 people in Demopolis who come because they want to come, because they want to hear about their local writers and they want to hear about the history of their local churches and they want to celebrate their local culture rather than teaching uh, 200 pubescent 18-year-olds at Auburn who were waiting all week to go to the Auburn-Georgia game and, and don't give a tinker's damn about what my lecture's about. Now you tell me which would you rather do? Uh, I, boy, I tell you, talk to Jay Lamar and get out there on the, on the circuit where real learning happens. One more question, Joe? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, human sciences, home economics, uh, you know, there are all sorts of byproducts. Uh, I.T. Titchener, would you believe I.T. Titchener, that Baptist minister in 1872, one of the first things he wanted to do was to admit females to Auburn. If he'd had his way, females would have been students here 20 years quicker than they were. Uh, and uh, you, you know the first area at Auburn to really open professional opportunities for women? It was the uh, home demonstration service in the College of Agriculture. Now, you couldn't be married. Once you're married, they kicked you out. But um, go to the library here and get Lynn Reef's dissertation on the home demonstration service uh, in five southern states that she studied, including Alabama. And what you will see is one of the first opportunities for economic and educational uh, liberal, liberalization and freedom for women was, in fact, the home demonstration service. And incidentally, according to Lorena Hickok and lots of other historians who've studied the matter, whereas the male county agents tended to go to the, to, to the upper crust large farmers and planters, curiously enough, the home demonstration agents were much more likely to go to the ordinary women and the small farm women. And the reports in, I, I've gone through literally hundreds and hundreds of county reports here at the University Archives for my book, Poor But Proud. And what I found was that the women by the 1930s were doing what the Federal Department of Agriculture asked them to do. And they were going to sharecroppers' wives, they were going to tenant farm wives, and they were discovering a world that most of them had never known before because they came mainly from small farm families and large farm families, but not from plantations for the most part. Uh, because if they'd come from plantations, they wouldn't have been at Auburn studying agriculture and trying to get a job in the home demonstration service. So what you get is a class division between planter's kids who became county agents, and small farmer girls who became home demonstration agents. And the result of that in the 1930s is the home demonstration agents were willing to go, unlike Lorena Hickok said, to the small farms and the sharecroppers' cabins and the tenant farm cabins and work with those women, whereas the county agents were not willing to go. Thank you very much.